Ina ita china china ita china china na Yesu means we will do our grooviest dance with him. Ina ita yimbelala ita yimbelala Hosanna means we will sing Hosanna with him. Okay, and so we do each one twice. So each chorus goes around twice, each verse goes around twice, and there's a verse, uh, there's a chorus in between each verse. Yeah? Se kore wana ozi yesu tapo na 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 ina ina tapo na ina tapo na. Well, welcome everybody to the end of our second day of our 2022 church retreat. Uh, thanks everyone for another amazing day. Uh, before we jump into the lesson, uh, first of all, what we are going to do, uh, we have a bit of business to attend to. We are going to be announcing the winners of our church Olympics. Before that, 
Uh, before that, uh, I don't know if Jenny's here. Jenny's up the back. Uh, but just want everyone to say a huge thank you. Big round of applause to yeah. Jenny. Yeah. In particular, she worked really, really hard to uh, come up with some great activities and plan everything together. Uh, she brought all the equipment and organized all of that as well. Uh, so big thanks to Jenny uh, for an awesome afternoon. Anyway, on to the business. We'll be announcing the top three teams in order of score from third to first, with the winner taking home the 2022 Golden Extended Arm Take Hold Trophy. Alright, right. starting in fourth, fourth place, we have the white team. <laughs> careful, careful, the pain will come off. Alrighty, on to the, uh, the actual podium. In third place we have the green team. Green team came in on third with 37 points. Coming up closely in second place was Black with 40 points. No. If they're lucky, if, if they share. And in first place, a little bit of a landslide on 48 points. Drum roll. We have the blue team! Yeah. Alright, maybe if we have the, the blue team, if someone wants to come up to receive. We, we want to thank all our family, all our sponsors, all our supporters. Uh, mom, if you're watching, shout out to my mom. Uh, I couldn't have done this without the team. Uh, what a privilege it is to be up here at the front and uh, really celebrate this great victory together. Woo! And sub to Zen Zone! Awesome, congrats the Oompa Loompas. All right, so we're running a little bit behind schedule, so just to give you guys an explanation of what's gonna happen, um, just after my lesson straight away, uh, we're gonna be moving to dinner. We've got an amazing dinner put on by Alex and Vivian, uh, Japanese curry. So I'll, I'll probably send you guys up in, in ministries after that, um, and then you can all feel free to sit down at the table for fellowship, and while that's going on, Floyd is going to be running uh, some fun games for us while we eat as well. And Kira. Anyway, we're going to be continuing through our theme for the church retreat, Take Hold, and today we are going to be looking at the idea of holding firmly. leave that right there. All right. And so the whole idea behind holding firmly, right, the idea when you have something valuable, when you have something you want to take care of or protect, it's not enough just to take hold of it, but obviously you want to be holding it very tightly. I'm excited to see a great transition in the church. We're moving from soccer to the rugby, right? It's the right team, right team. Right team, right sport, yeah? I'm loving the rugby analogies. It's great to see a shift. Maybe we can play some more rugby on Sundays as well. Full contact. And so in rugby, we understand this idea of holding firmly very well. If you guys don't know, there are three very important golden rules in rugby that we were taught from year seven all the way onwards. Those rules were possession, possession, possession. Oh. Yep. Yep. That's it. Three, three important rules. Possession, possession, and then lastly, 
possession, right? Right, and the whole idea, it doesn't matter if you make meters, if it doesn't matter if you lose meters, what matters most is that you hold on to the ball when you go to ground, right? And so here in this passage we're going to be jumping into today, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, and he calls them to hold firmly to the gospel. Because the gospel is the message that brought them their salvation, and in the end it's what they need to hold on to the most. So if you guys want to be there with me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to be reading the whole chapter today. And then pulling, seeing what we can pull out of it as well. So, oh, this is a little slippery. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are, who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do, not even to be des- and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by, grace of, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, uh, each in turn, Christ, uh, the first fruits. Then, when He comes, those who belong to Him. Then the end will come when He hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after He has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For He must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy to be, to be beyond is death, to be destroyed, sorry, is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, what it's, now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, uh, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant, uh, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds have another, and fish have another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. 
The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and stars differ, and star, and star differ from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of, was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. And so this, this occurs at the end of the book of 1 Corinthians. And Paul is writing at the time to a church that is completely full of problems, right? Paul has been informed of discord, gross sexual immorality, and all sorts of divisions and dissensions, and the church has come in and asked him for help on marriage and food sacrifices. He addresses earlier on a man sleeping with his husband's wife, oh, sorry, with his father's wife. He, he notices, it's been a long day, it's been a long, it's been a long day. A man, a man sleeping with his father's wife, the rich are getting drunk at communion, and the poor people are showing up to that same communion, going without food and wine at the same time. Yeah. The church is, is so completely backwards, and for us, it just seems weird that this would even be a reality. Because when you think about it, right, in reality, we are, we're no different from the world, right? We're not better than them, we're not more perfect than them. We're all flawed, but you do get the impression that we as disciples, as a church, we have a better reason to do good than they do, beyond our own personal feelings, right? All of us in this room and everyone in the church in Corinth, they are compelled by an omnipotent, all-powerful God who has not only saved them, but has stuck with them through the worst times. Compare this to the pagans of the world who lived with the belief of no God, or a God who promised them a transactional relationship at best. You sacrifice this amount to me, I promise this amount to you, right? If they do this, their God does this. You would imagine, for a Christian, they would be far more compelled to uphold a higher standard than what we see in the book of Corinthians. But Paul even comments that what they are doing is so bad that it isn't even tolerated by the pagans. Oh, I don't have it up there. And so, uh, and so as he goes through all of these issues, he goes through all of them one by one, and at the end, he kind of addresses one final thing. He brings it to their attention, which is this passage that we just read, right? Which is, no matter how bad a church is going, no matter what the problems are occurring in there, there is no way that a religious group that is founded on the belief of the death and the resurrection of, the ma of a man would go on to deny the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. It, it's just counterintuitive up until this point, right? But what we see is that that is so completely wrong. Paul challenges them here and says, how can some of you say then that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
right? It just seems so absurd that you could be a Christian and not believe this. And we know uh, that sometime later on there were some early Gnostic groups that later came to develop this kind of theology. They were called the Docetists. But the, the church in Corinth is a church so early to the resurrection and so closely connected to Paul and his theology that it is totally mind-blowing that this could even possibly happen. And throughout this chapter, Paul goes on to argue that the reason this is the case is because they have not held firmly to the gospel. This church has been so strongly influenced by their surrounding environment that the gospel no longer stands as first importance in their life, right? And instead, they're living, instead of living their life through the lens of the gospel, their surrounding environment has distorted their idea of what the gospel actually is. This belief could have come through a couple of different avenues. Right? We know that the Sadducees were a Jewish group who denied the resurrection of the dead. We know they were around at this time. But more likely than that, they were influenced primarily by the Greek philosophers of the time period who were the leading intellectuals at the time. And we know in, in the book of Acts that Paul runs into them in the past and says that when he challenged them, they sneered at him because he even mentioned the idea of the resurrection of the dead. Yeah. And so Paul has challenged this, this worldview outside of the church, but now he has to come in and actually deal with it inside the church as well. And so in response to them, Paul call, calls them to hold firmly to the gospel. And what this word hold firmly means linguistically, this word katecho, the, the Greek word actually means firstly to restrain something or hold something down. And it carries a secondary meaning of adhering strongly to something. And so, you know, you get the sense that Paul is trying to tell them, no matter what happens in your life, do not let go of the gospel. Yeah. Right? For fear that you will never be able to get hold of it again. Grab it and hold it tightly. Hold it down. Do not let it go. Do not lose sight of it forever. And you get the sense that as Paul is talking to these guys, he's trying to give them something tangible to grasp onto. And so the way that he handles the issue, he handles it in a way that is so unbelievably simple to understand, hold the gospel, but he also gives it to them in such a practical way that the Corinthian church can actually rebuild their foundations and hold firmly to the gospel moving forward as well. And so I got, I got three ideas from the text about what it means to hold fast and what we as a church can get out of this text as well. So this leads me to my first point, hold firmly to what's important. And so Paul begins his letter by calling the church to what is most important, the gospel, right? These are the words by which they were saved, the words that he passed on to them of first importance. He calls them firstly to hold firm to the Gospels, to the Gospels, sorry. Now, obviously, the, the Corinthian church, or this letter to the Corinthian church, was written to a group of Christians, right? Not for everyone. And our job as disciples is to make the Bible of first importance in the lives of the people we reach out to. But for the people who are not Christians, the Gospel is understandably not of first importance in their life, Right? But for us as Christians, the gospel is not simply meant to be at the center of our lives, but it should be in everything that we do and in the way that we live our lives. Right? The truth of the gospel should not only stand at the front of our minds, but it should actually influence the way that we live and the decisions that we make. Why? Because if the Bible is not true, our faith is not true, and we put our hopes in absolutely nothing. But... If the gospel is true, nothing could ever stand before it and nothing could be more important than it. And so, you know, you get the sense Paul is trying to reason with these guys, but he's in this super weird position right now, right? Because the, the Christians who should have this of first importance have gone so wildly off track that you almost need to treat them like they're not disciples to begin with, right? And so to address this issue... Paul begins by trying to stress the importance, oh, sorry, he's trying to stress the importance of the resurrection to a group of people who don't even believe in the possibility of resurrection. But they follow, for some reason, they follow a religion that is literally impossible without it. It sounds like Paul is talking to a group of people that believe in some general idea of who God is, but they've totally lost sight of what the gospel is through Jesus, right? 
They have not been holding the gospel close to them. The gospel has simply become of secondary importance. And in their church, you can see that the results of this. They preach all sorts of ideas and themes from the Bible that you can see earlier in the, in the epistles, but in living it out, it's all sorts of messed up. Right? So these guys, they preach love for all people just as Jesus did, but by living it out, what they do is they choose to tolerate the sins of other people, not rocking the boat, so much so that even non-religious people are kind of weirded out by it. You see, in the church, they pursue knowledge and understanding through the Bible, as any good disciple should. But how do they live it out? They live it out by dismissing uh, the tempting and dangerous things that they should avoid and intentionally putting themselves in dangerous situations like food sacrifices to idols, saying, this is fine because I've God on my side, right? And we even see later on when it comes to communion, right? They ran into a situation where... All of the rich and the poor were finally coming together in church, having communion together. There were no barriers. There was equality. It was sweet, right? And they were glorifying themselves for being unified. But what happened in actuality is all of the wealthy people took time off work early, showed up to church, got drunk and ate all of the food, and they left all their slaves behind to do all the work. And these slaves rocked up later, not getting to take part in the Lord's Supper at all. And you've got a bunch of starving poor people and drunk rich people and everyone's gone this is unity and you can see that all of this has come because it isn't the gospel that they are holding firmly that they're not holding firmly to and so you got to ask how in the world do you get across to a group like that and paul takes the approach to literally break down the argument into its simplest form right he doesn't try and prove the resurrection he tries to reason the resurrection out of their idiocy, right? And Paul does this by using a series of if-slash-then statements to explain his points, right? And I'll, I'll explain what that is, but an if-then statement is basically, it's called a conditional statement, right? And basically it goes, if this one thing is true, then it follows that this other thing must be true also, right? So if A, then B. A good example, if it is raining outside, then I need to get an umbrella, right? If A, then B. And it's one of the most simple logical formulas that you can actually start with. But with these statements, the first thing that you need to do is prove that A is true, and then you go on and you need to prove that B would logically come as a result of A. Paul, in this instance, assumes that resurrection is true. He assumes point A, then he needs to go on and prove that point B follows logically. And Paul uses this in his argument using the most bare-bones, straightforward argument to show them the silliness of their beliefs. Starting in verse 12, he says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Continuing in verse 16, it says, If, you, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ a lot. And he sets out a very simple way, starting here. Logically, he comes to this conclusion. What are you guys doing? But Paul goes on, right? If the resurrection of the dead is, pos is impossible, Jesus could not have risen and our faith is in vain. But, in verse 20, he says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Right? And he sets this as the basis for his argument moving forward. And I think we need to do the same as well. But this is the thing that we should be starting with in our beliefs. Not, not with the possibility of the resurrection or the comfort of our own lives. We shouldn't be starting with ourselves or anything. What comes first should be the gospel. And so you, you, you've got to ask, what does that look like? And I think a really simple thing to do is follow Paul's formula. We ask ourselves the same questions that Paul asked the Corinthian church here. If Christ has raised from the dead, then dot, 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 right? And so we ask, if Christ has raised from the dead, then should I be using this retreat as an opportunity to take some time for myself? Does that follow logically from point A? 
Of course not. Why? Because in Galatians 6.10 it says, As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. This retreat is that opportunity that we should be taking advantage of. Not to take time for ourselves, but to do good for the other people in this room. You can go even further. If Christ has been raised from the dead, then I should live my life how I want because that's what Jesus would want from me. Does that follow from the start? Of course not. In 1 Peter 2.21, it says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Right? I think this is what it means to hold firmly to the gospel. And this is a question we can ask every single day. When we wake up every day, if Christ raised from the dead, then what should my day look like as a result? And then we can go to our quiet times for that day and ask ourselves, do our quiet times support that conclusion? I'm feeling, you know, Jesus raised from the dead, but I'm feeling a little bit tired today. Well, what did my quiet times say about that? Like, what? And you get, you know... uh, This is a question that puts the gospel first in our minds in the morning, and it's a question that we can ask every single day. And we do that to keep the gospel firmly planted, holding it exactly where it needs to be, right up the top of first importance in our lives. Moving on to my second point, hold firmly to your senses. So in verse 33, Paul says, Do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. So Paul says to these guys, he says, come back to your senses. He says, wake up and look around at the state of the church. Because the state of the church is in complete disarray. And all of you are completely going out of your way to let these things slide. Everyone here knows what's wrong with it. You can all see the problems, but you get the sense that for the Corinthian church, they're stuck in in an almost stupor, a half-sleep-like state where they don't care about what is right and what is wrong anymore. They've got what they've wanted. They've got unity, a little bit of persecution, but they overcame that. They're treated well by the community by now. All they care about is maintaining their present state rather than achieving a state of godliness for the church. And so Paul calls them to come back, right, to hold firmly to their senses. And note that Paul says, come back to their senses, right? He doesn't say, rely more on your senses. Because I think we hear, you know, ideas like this or things like this preached in the Bible, you know, talking about our senses. And we conclude that what we need to do as, re- as a result is push ourselves to think better, right? Be more logical, rely heavily on our intuition, our gut feeling push ourselves really hard to align our intuition with the gospel. But what do we all know about intuition in, our, in this room? It is not always correct. Right? The intuition tells a child to grab a hot pan or touch a hot stove. All the teenagers in this room know why that's stupid. But intuition tells all the teenagers in this room that they are right and everyone else doesn't understand them, right? And all the adults in this room can see the issues with all of that. But as you grow older and you grow wiser, you do not get a sharper sense of intuition. You just learn that your intuition is not always right. And I think we need to understand that our intuition is never perfect and it is not something that we can rely on inherently. What we need to do is find something that we actually can rely on to go, uh, and go back to that sort of a mindset, right? Because Paul is writing to these guys. At one point, the Corinthian church was definitely right and godly. When Paul was there, he's saying, how have you guys fallen so far? Go back to that state. You get the sense in their spiritual stupor, their senses have dulled and they aren't functioning properly. How foolish would it be of Paul to say to these people to rely on their senses when they're in this state. It's nonsense. Now, if you're a uni student, if you studied it all in the past, if you've done anything like that, chances are at some point you've had to do do an all-nighter. Right? 
I, I, I did uni for four years. I did a good number of all-nighters in my time. Right? I did a few by myself. Most of the time, I did them with Alex. Those were the really productive ones. Get a podcast going, side income. But I also did a few all-nighters with Katsuki. And I remember so many times asking Katz, do you want to do an all-nighter? How's that assignment doing? Every time he said no, he's like, no, I'll get on top of it. Don't worry about it. So annoying. But then one day, my opportunity came. He left an assignment until the next day. Yep. <laughs> and I was like, do you want to do an all-nighter? And he was like, uh, yeah, sure, I'll do one. It, <laughs> All right, Isaac, heal me soon. <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was a strange one. Right? We, we started off the night, we, we went shopping, we bought a bunch of snacks, we got to uni at like 8 o'clock. You, know, you get there, you get the study center. We're, we're not going to study from the start, right? That's just that's stupid. So we sit down, we, we play video games for two hours. <laughs> right? Get, get, get the right mindset. Alright, now we're ready to get started. Okay, so 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock we start studying. And at like 11.30 at night, I was working. Katz looks up and he says to me, he's like, Hey, dude, i got to go to office works. So Do you want to come? <laughs> I'm like, look, I, I don't think office works is going to be open at 11.30 at night. <laughs> Closes at 9. <laughs> And he was like, he's like, don't worry, I don't need to get anything from Officeworks. I'm doing an architecture assignment. I just got to measure the perimeter of the building. <laughs> and so we, we drove to Officeworks at like midnight. We walked around the building in, in pitch black. <laughs> we, went, we went back to uni. We, we did our, I didn't, I didn't have any assignments. I was just studying. But he, he finished his assignment at like 5 a.m., and we were both done, right? So we're super tired, we're uncomfortable, we're like hungry, our eyes hurt. We just wanted to go home. So it's like 5 a.m., it's like 4.35, right? So we get, we get all our stuff, we walk outside, and both of us are just hit by like four degree freezing cold morning frost, yeah? And so we, you know, it's been a heated room, we walk out, and we're just like petrified. And so we go from this state of like, I just want to go home and sleep, to like sprinting towards the car, right? Because we needed to get to the heater. It, at that point, it didn't matter how tired we were anymore. We were so freezing, we're like running all the way across campus, like got to get to the car, right? So we, we get there, we went to Macca's. We, we, we go home and you know, we're just about to fall asleep and then Katz realizes he's got another essay due that day. It's <laughs> a great question, that's a great question, Katz. And so, yeah. But like, seriously, we, at that time when we were leaving, we were in such a state of stupor at five in the morning, we couldn't even talk to each other, right? We couldn't get ourselves back to our senses, but it, it, that shock of, of cold air brought us right back to reality, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we need something pretty intense to wake us up. But I feel like, you know, the same goes for our spiritual lives as well. If you look all throughout the Old Testament, when God wants Israel to repent, He doesn't go and work through Israel internally, yeah. right? The way that God almost always works is he will send a prophet from the outside to go into Israel or Judah and call them to repentance from the outside looking in. And I think for us, if we want to be holding fast to our senses and actually being spiritually vigilant to the sin going on in our lives, or the issues going on in the church, it does not begin with us resolving ourselves to change or becoming internally motivated, Right? To wake up from that spiritual stupor, it starts with someone or something coming into our lives and showing us exactly what we need to change. Mm -hmm. Calling us back to our senses exactly like what Paul does with the Corinthian church in this letter. 
But I think if that's going to happen, we need to be willing not to just let people examine our hearts and our lives, but we need to be going out and asking people to come into our lives and look at it for us. Yeah. Right? Seeking out time with that brother or sister, telling them the things that we are feeling and doing, being completely honest and transparent with them. Right? And by doing so, they, can, they will be able to see the dullness in our senses and wake us back up to, reality, to the reality of our own sin. You know, let us be a church of people who are seeking out people to examine our lives, clinging to those sharp senses that we once had, not relying on our own intuition to judge whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, but going out and doing whatever it takes to hold firmly to the senses that Paul calls us back to. Yeah. Yeah. So... Oh, that's the, that's the all-nighter slide. Oh, oh, so well, it's a good, good story, good story. Third point for tonight, hold firmly to the work of the Lord. And so, you know, right at the very end, in verse 58, Paul says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And so by this point, Paul has explained everything to the church. He's reasoned with them. He showed them the absurdity of their beliefs. He showed them the reasonable, reasonableness of the gospel. And now you get the sense that finally, Paul has got them back to the starting point, right? They've gone all the way this way. Now they're back to baby disciple. Let's start moving them forward now, right? They can start fresh from the beginning, holding firmly to what is of first importance. And so... What do you say to a Christian that understands the role of Jesus' death and resurrection and isn't caught up in any major sin anymore? Well, you send them out to do the work, right? The implication of this passage in verse 58 is that you move from understanding to action, right? And Paul argues then that by actually going out and living the gospel, right, giving yourself fully to the work, you are able to constantly remind yourself of what the gospel actually is. And the principle is, is pretty similar to driving a car, right? Does it, how many people in here know how to drive a manual? Right. Wow. Tina, Tina knows how to drive a manual. Tina knows how to drive a manual. <laughs> it's one of those old ones. Yeah, the manual, you know, it's, it's going out of fashion. People prefer automatics now, you know. The manual, it's funner to drive. It's more enjoyable. Takes a little bit more practice though, right? The, the, the clutch control, the hill starts, the gear changes, the, the parallel parking, all that, right? All of it takes time to learn. It takes even longer for a, for a manual license, right? But when, when you first go in for your license... The people that are there to actually give you a license don't expect you to know what any of those words mean, right? Let alone how to actually go out and do those things, right? By extension, they don't expect you to have any experience either. And so when you first go in for your learner's license for the very first time, you don't start by getting a license, right? You don't start by practicing either. You start by doing a test. And... <laughs> You know, they do that because before you get the license, you've got to take the online test basically to prove that you know and understand how the road rules, right? After you take the test, no one expects you to know how to drive as a result of that, right? And so even Paul at the end of this passage would not expect the church to go out and be perfect disciples after hearing this message. Yeah. With driving a car and getting your L's, right, once you pass the exam, you are actually able to get a license and start driving. But the exam is only there so that we can understand how to handle certain situations safely. But it isn't until you actually get out and start driving that you can actually begin to understand how to actually move the car. And then once you learn how to drive and you drive more and more and more, it becomes muscle memory and you learn so much faster through experience. And I think this is an important concept for us to understand spiritually as well. Right? If we want to hold firmly to Jesus and continue to push ourselves to grow, to understand him and be more like him, it does not come through more theory and more understanding. Yeah. Right? Paul has given these guys this baseline explanation so that they can get their foundations back on track. Yeah. But to actually turn the church around requires everyone in there to get out and actually start doing the work. Yeah. 
And the hopes is that in doing so, they will continue to grow in their understanding of the gospel through experience. I think it's the same for us as well. Right? As, we, as we leave the church retreat this weekend, we should not leave pushing ourselves to understand what it means linguistically to hold firmly. Right? Or to remember contextually what exactly is happening in the church in Sardis. All of these things are important in one way or another for our depth and understanding, but we should be going away compelled to live out the points of these things in our lives. Don't leave the church retreat understanding why confession is important. Go away convicted to start confessing to someone regularly. Right? Don't leave simply remembering what questions we should be asking ourselves every day. Leave the retreat with the discipline to ask yourselves those questions every day in your quiet times. Doing all of these things, holding firmly to the work given to each of us, because it is by doing this that we continue to stay close to the gospel and actually know what it means to live it out. Right? Leaving today, guys, let's not leave this church retreat like the Corinthian church, with the gospel of secondary importance, right? Somewhere off in the background, you know, being a vague reminder in our mind. Let's leave holding firmly to it, putting it of first importance in our lives, living it out in the coming weeks. Thanks so much, guys, for listening. Amen. All right. We're going to jump straight to the dinner now. Uh, Alex and Vivian should be all set to go. Thanks to those guys and Wayne also for helping out. We're basically going to pray, and then I'm going to hopefully, I'm going to try and send you guys up in ministries first, okay? So we'll start with the, the marrieds. And then the, the campus, no. <laughs> marrieds, pros, then the campus and the teens, okay? So if you guys all want to bow with me, bow with me in a word of prayer, we'll pray for the food.